Okay, now is the time where we can start talking about continuous wave functions and we were going to what we're going to do in this video is essentially show that a wave function or either this is would be an eigenstate of that wave function because you notice the subscript n here which is just a positive integer from 1 to infinity that this wave function is actually ortho or this basis for this wave function is orthonormal and we're going to show that using the inner product so basically this wave function is defined as a sine function within the realm of this domain so we have x from 0 to l it is defined as this function and it is 0 elsewhere so what that means is that if we were to plot something like psi of 1 then we would have square root of 2 over l sine of pi x over l if we were to have the second one psi 2 we would have 2l sine 2 pi x over l and so on and so forth so we're going to continue this for whatever number of eigenstates in this case there's, there's a number infinite number of eigenstates so this is analogous to what we talked about when we talked about an eigenfunction that had a finite number of eigenstates so say a b c and so on this is the same concept but now instead of having these constants we have or, or this constant probability amplitudes we have probability amplitudes that are a continuous function of x or in this case it's a piecewise function of x nevertheless it is continuous within this domain so this is a wave function or an eigenfunction whichever name you want to use for it the most common the more common name is wave function we're also going to call this a wave function from now on and essentially this represents a probability amplitude and because this is a function of x which is the the position along the x-axis then this is a probability amplitude that it will be be within any interval along the x-axis so what that means is that if we wanted to have a probability an actual measurable probability and we'll call this I'm gonna call it rho x so this is just gonna be a probability density we can simply take so of n we can take one of these basis functions take the complex conjugate of it then multiply it by another one which is the the wave function itself and we know that this is going to be equal to the magnitude of the wave function squared so this is a probability density and if we integrate this with respect to all x so from minus infinity to infinity if we integrate this so let's say x goes from minus infinity to infinity so for all x we're going to have integral of this probability density and recall from probability theory that a probability density is just a function that characterizes the probability of a wave function or a, or a function in general this should be equal to 1 that is assuming that this wave function is normalized this should be n here okay so that's the general idea of this and in fact we don't usually just take one eigenstate we take just the the wave function because this is going to be valid for all the eigenstates it has so this is what we should be looking for and you'll notice that this continuous probability this continuous probability is simply going to be the inner product of the wave function with itself so the, pr the inner product of the wave function with itself is going to be that probability that's fairly straightforward now we we can find the probability of some eigenstate so what is the probability that the wave function will be in the eigenstate say 1 then we would take the inner product of 1 with respect to the wave function the general wave function and then we would just do the same but the thing is that we now have an infinite number of 
wave function. So this is not really going to be very useful for us. Although what we can do is we can simply take this, um, we can just take the first element times the first element and that's going to give us the probability. That's essentially all we need to do. It is going to give us the probability because we know that if we have an infinite number of eigenstates, but if we just require that it is going to be in a single eigenstate, so everything else here will be zero, then all the zeros would cancel out all those constants or the, all those values and we would be left with a squared like that. So that would give us the probability. Okay, so that's just a ge another general concept here. We will use this to our advantage and we're now going to prove that this wave function is actually orthonormal or this basis set for the wave function is orthonormal. So let me just get rid of this on the screen so we can have some space to work with it. It's a really nice thing. Um, th this analogy between uh, accidentally erased the wave function, so yeah, we have it here. It's a really nice thing, and I'm surprised that they don't talk about this analogy between vectors and, uh, and wave functions more often, but it is a really nice connection. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the inner product of, we're going to make it th this very general, we're going to take some basis M, and we're going to take another basis N, so this is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of complex conjugate of m x times wave function n dx and we know that this is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to l because remember that the wave function regardless of what this integer is is going to be 0 outside of this domain so we don't need to integrate that we know it's going to be 0 this right here, this is going to be sine. Actually, I'm just going to write down. We're going to square this, obviously, because it's going to be the same constant for both of them. We're going to have sine of m pi x over l. And l is just a constant. And sine is n pi x over l dx. So what we're going to do now is we're going to integrate this. If this is an orthonormal basis, then for any m and n, we should get 0 as long as m is not equal to n. And we will show that here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take out that constant that's going to be 2 over L. Now we're going to integrate this. And to do so, we're going to use integration by parts. So let's say we integrate this one first. So... I'm going to integrate this one first. Okay, let me just write it this way. Let's have this one. So that's going to be minus cosine. And we need to take out the constant. So that's going to be L over m pi cosine of m pi x over L times sine n pi x over L. And now we're going to subtract the integral of the derivative of the other function times this integrated function. So this minus is going to cancel out with that one, so that becomes a plus. We're going to have L over m pi. And now we're going to have the integral from 0 to L of cosine m pi x over L times cosine. n pi x over L, and you can't really see it much here, but hopefully you see that this is the integration from 0 to L. And this is n and this is m, so obviously we need to deal with that. And the one thing I forgot is that because we differentiated this function, we need to take out the n pi over L. So basically this L is going to cancel out with that one, and the pi is going to cancel out as well. So we're going to be left with n over m, like that. 
Now what we can do now is we're gonna have to perform an integration by parts again because we need to get a, a meaningful solution out of this. So that's precisely what we're going to do. However, we notice that this is not gonna go anywhere because we're essentially integrating a product of two distinct trigonometric functions. So this is just going to keep cycling around. I could get back to the original function here and then substitute in for some unit like let's say integral equals to this and then substitute it here and then rearrange the terms but that's going to take a few more integration by parts what we can do instead is we can say well we know that because we have a product of two trigonometric functions the expansion is just going to be a combination the expansion is just going to be a product a sum of products of the form cosine m pi sine and pi or the other way around it could be cosine n pi and sine of n pi and then basically we're just gonna keep having that because once we replace the limits in we're gonna have l over l so the l's are gonna cancel out we're gonna be left with this so in the case we replace this with L, we know that for any multiple integer of pi, sine is going to be zero. So this is going to be zero. So the whole sum has to be zero. Similarly, when we put zero into these equations, cosine is going to be equal to one, but sine is going to be equal to zero. So in the end, we're going to have zero. If you want, I invite you to actually do the calculation like do integration by parts a couple more times until you get back to this form, rearrange the terms, and then see what you get. But you will get zero because this is in fact orthonormal. This is an orthonormal basis, so you would expect that the inner product of two distinct wave functions is going to be zero. So this is for the case where m is not equal to n. Now let's take another example. So instead of trying to look through different integers let's say that m is equal to n so we're gonna work through that and see what we get and we have discussed previously that the inner product of a of a normalized wave function should be one if it is normalized of course so we're gonna have this and instead of having this, now I'm going to have a product of the wave function with its own complex conjugate, which means that we're just going to have this. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have, well, we're going to replace the limits first. We know it's going to go from 0 to L. We know that the constant attached to the wave function, the amplitude, is going to be square root of 2 over L. So this is just going to come out to be 2 over L and now we're going to have sine of n pi x over L dx and we're going to integrate this actually this should be squared so we're going to have 2L we're going to use trigonometric substitution here so we're going to have 1 over 2 so these two are going to cancel out we're going to have 1 minus cosine of 2 n pi x over l because remember that the trigonometric substitution tells us that we're going to take the argument and we're going to double it so we're going to multiply the whole argument by 2 now that we have this in this form we can actually integrate it. so this is going to be equal to 1 over l this here becomes x this here so if we integrate cosine we get sine so this is going to be minus sine and now we're going to have l over 2 n pi sine of 2 n pi x l from 0 to l and now what happens here is when we put l into this equation here the l's cancel out and we're left with sine 2 n pi and we know that n is just a positive integer, so we know that for any multiple integer of pi, sine is just going to be 0, so it is going to vanish here. And similarly, when we put 0 into the equation, this is 0, and this is also going to be 0, 
So in the end, the only term that is left is when x equals to L. So that's going to be L over L, which is equal to 1. And because this inner product with itself, for the case M equals to N is equal to 1, then we say that the wave function is normalized. Otherwise, we would have to normalize it by multiplying it by some normalization constant. So this is the general idea behind wave functions in the terms of continuous functions. And this actually extends all the way to three dimensions. So we will see later on that this extends to any number of dimensions. And the same concept of the inner product is going to come up over and over again. It's a really important concept, so that's why I want you to understand. It. And what we have done here is we have taken a infinite number of eigenstates or, or, or a basis for the wave function and we found that it is orthonormal so all the eigenstates are orthonormal to each other so if we perform a measurement on this wave function all its eigenstates will collapse and we're going to be left with one single eigenstate and the the one quantity that we measure out of it is going to be associated with the probability amplitude of that eigenstate so hopefully this clears up some of the doubts you may have had about eigenstates and eigenfunctions and so on. And now that we have covered this, we can finally start talking about more complicated concepts. And in the next video, we're going to start talking about the concept of a mathematical operator and how it relates to quantum mechanics.